dragonfish. 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 And even this cute little weirdo is a dragonfish. He really is cute, isn't he? And he's heavily armoured, as you can see in this x-ray. What about this for a trick? He's so cute, I think we should give him a new name. And at the end, with your help, we will. On this channel, there's lots of comments about whether the deep sea dragonfish are really dragonfish, viperfish, or loose jaws, or, or something else. Well, actually, with common names, you can never be certain. And many other kinds of fish have been called dragonfish in particular, too. Basically, anything with a fierce face that seems as if it could breathe fire, or big fins that could look like dragon's wings. And it gets very confusing when dragonfish are often known by different common names. This fish, for example, is sometimes called a dragonfish, but it's also known as a firefish or a scorpionfish because of the venom in its spines. But it's most commonly called the lionfish. Who really knows why? So I thought it's time, maybe, to help the confusion and give a few facts about the different dragons. They're all amazing. But different dragonfishes have very little in common. For example, this is the black deep sea dragonfish from about 600 meters or 2,000 feet. It's a fierce ocean predator that hunts in the dark. And this is the freshwater arowana, also called a dragonfish because of its resemblance to a Chinese dragon. There are about 10 types from all over the world, but the Asian arowana is the most highly valued, sometimes commanding hundreds of thousands of dollars in the aquarium trade. So there's no surprises that the Asian arowana in particular is critically endangered in the wild. Found in increasingly fewer slow-moving rivers and swamps in places like Vietnam, Sumatra and Borneo. In the USA, it's no longer permitted to keep them without a special permit that you likely only get for research or being a public aquarium. But more about that in another video. So what's the way out of this common name dragonfish nightmare? Well, this guy, who you may well know, called Carl Linnaeus, already solved it nearly 200 years ago. As an expert Swedish botanist and zoologist himself, he'd been frustrated by all the common name confusion too. And he published an 11-page pamphlet called Systema Natura, or System of Nature, in which he proposed a binomial or two-name system for naming all the plants and animals in the world, making sure that each had its own specific name. By the 10th edition of Systema Natura, in 1758, he'd named over 4,000 animals and 7,000 plants, and created a system used by the scientific community ever since. So, as you likely know, this scientific name comes in two parts, a genus name, grouping together very similar kinds, and a unique specific name, its species. By the way, you're called Homo sapiens, of course. Scientific names seem to get more authority from the Greek and Latin of the Roman Empire. But recently, other languages have been used too. But what use is this all, really? Well, to take one of our examples, these dragonfish, or lionfish, come in at least 12 similar species names, all from the Taroist genus. But one of them in particular has become a pest. Taroist volatans, a native of the Indo-Pacific. It was released from aquariums and now breeds widely in the Caribbean, causing damage to the reef by aggressively preying on fish not used to its presence. To study it and the effects on the ecosystem, you must first identify the specific species with the accurate two-word scientific name, so that everyone knows what you're talking about, and so you can distinguish it from other similar species, which may not have the same type of behaviour at all. In other words, the first part of any ecological research is to get an accurate scientific name for the key species in that habitat. 
So why do we bother using common names? Well, they're much easier than those Greek and Latin names, which is pretty much an extinct everyday language, and difficult for most of us to pronounce. But it's really only those scientific names that Linnaeus started that can pin down the exact species. So let's sort out these dragons, which all have the same common name. Uh, I don't really know any of these languages, but I can look it up. And it must be said that Latin and Greek names can be very descriptive. And for the Asian Arowana, which is called Scleropages formosus, the Scleropages means hard leaves. And that's what those scales look like, solid interlocking leaves. And the formosus, that's the species name, means just beautiful or handsome, which is of course why they're so desirable. And this little guy's scientific name is a mix of languages. Europegasus draconis. In Greek, Uri means long, and Pegasus was a mythical winged horse that came from the blood of the multi-headed monster Medusa. While Draconis, the Latin bit, comes from Draco, meaning fabulous and lizard-like. So they've packed a heck of a lot there in that scientific name. And this group of dragons, or lionfish, we've already met. Terois, from the Greek for feathered. Even with scientific names, some of the deep sea fish are really difficult to identify. But this one, the Pacific black dragonfish from California, is most likely Idiacanthus antrostomus. Idiacanthus refers to its lack of scales, antrostomus to a cavernous mouth. But you have to admit that those official scientific names are a bit of a mouthful. Yuri Pegasus draconis even if they're often very useful. And when we're talking about things like arowana, we usually know what kind of fish we're talking about because they're all fresh water. And again, with the deep sea fish, we generally know it's the deep sea dragons we mean. Yet of course, to avoid any confusion at all, scientists will use the Latin names. One funny thing about common names is that you can kind of just make them up. Scientific names have to be registered with an official biological database and have to follow certain rules. But if your common name sticks and it's good, then that's what people will tend to call that animal, fish, plant, or whatever. So let's go back to that little dragonfish. They're also known as sea moths, actually, because they're able to walk along the seabed and have those stubby but big petrol fins, a bit like moths. It's quite a descriptive name, but it doesn't seem to catch the comedy of the animal. They have an almost human character, like a little old man with that long snout and angular face. So I think he could be called Lenny. <clears throat> yes, Lenny seems to give him that character. The Lenny fish. Will it catch on? Tell me in the comments below, or suggest your own name. Well, there may still be just about plenty of fish in the sea, and in fact plenty of those have no names at all, scientific or common, because many are still to be found, particularly in the deep, dark ocean. But you can bet your bottom dollar that someone is going to call one a dragonfish. <laughs>